episode two recap of Alone Australia. I just watched it last night and uh, yeah, so interesting for me to watch. I'm gonna reveal some stuff uh, at the end when I talk about my own situation, uh, which wasn't talked about on the show. And I'll be interested to see if you could guess what it is. I'll, I'll come back to it though. All right, so the biggest news out of that really is Beck and Rob tapping out. Now, it's uh, people I think will be quick to judge that but I think if you listen, certainly for me, I think the reasoning behind Beck and Rob leaving it are basically similar things. And they are basically, they wanna be with their family. Now people think, oh look, it's one day one, day two, that's not very long. Well, it's actually been probably about 10 days since they'd been away from home, right? So it's not just one or two days. There's, there's some very interesting things that I think um, Rob said, he said, that you know, like the, the Palawa, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, didn't stay inland at that time of year. They went to the coast, because that's the smart thing to do. So he said it's um, quite a descriptive word. It's unnatural to be in this situation, and it is unnatural. And alone is unnatural, the fact that you have a tap out button. So Aboriginal people just followed common sense. They were extremely skilled. And why would you go and sit in a spot with no food where it's uncomfortable and stuff for no reason? Now, of course, the reason is money, but when you get out there, money's not that important. <laughs> and you very quickly go back to what's important, my family, I haven't seen my family for 10 days. I miss them. Um, yeah, I wanna go home. So I, you know, in some ways it's the smart move. Like there's this, it's almost like a, quite a, a European thing about this, like, this mentality of gathering all your nuts for the winter, that kind of thing that we do. And like, I guess I'm pointing out a, a cultural difference there. And I don't know if that's the case with, with Beck and Rob either, but we, this European mentality that we have of go hard, um, put up with just rubbish for a long time is actually a survival situation suited to the Northern environment. Okay, because Europeans came from Europe where survival is about saving up your nuts for the winter and hunkering down and freezing and all this kind of stuff. It's not the kind of survival mentality that helps, that works particularly well on the Australian continent. And the, the perfect sense of that is the fact that Aboriginal people were masters of Australia before we got here. They had every chance to try every different technique and that was the technique that worked. So I definitely don't dismiss um, their different cultural way of thinking, and we can learn a lot from it. Okay, it, so anyway, it, it was it's sad to see them go because they're both such awesome characters in their own right. Like they're they're just so honest, and yeah, it's 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 sad to see them go. Um, Beck also said, you know, she's a she's big enough; she doesn't need to prove herself, and she's not just saying that. That's a that's a cop out thing that some people can say. When it comes to Beck, that's that's not her. She, she's like, both of these people are really important members of their community back home. And they know that their community is, you know, struggling a little bit without them. And they feel that responsibility to get home. And they don't need to sit there for a TV show to really have their own self-worth. They've, they've both got their own self-worth without a TV show. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's one of the reasons why this show is so interesting because Everyone has their own different reasons. Okay, uh, I didn't mention Pete last time. I just forgot he was only appeared in the first episode a little bit. So obviously Pete's got a pretty tricky area there. He's got a, a really large area of mud and he's struggling with his gear being wet. I'm not quite sure how it got wet, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult when your stuff gets wet. You just cannot dry it out. Like it, I mean, even just a pair of thermals, like it can take a long, long time to dry because it can rain for a long time. In fact, I'm surprised at how good the weather looks because <laughs> uh, I don't remember it looking that good. So maybe, you know what that is? It's probably that when the rain stops for that one hour of the day, we go outside and we do our things. And that's probably where more action is happening when the weather's good, right? But the rest of the time we're honking down in our little shelters. Gina, I thought it was so funny when she um, said like, oh, I just, you know, she's so fat that when she gets up, she can't, <laughs> like it feels wrong. I had the same kind of thing. Like you feel like a different person, like you're inhabiting a different person's body. Just those actions of getting up, um, tying your shoelaces, reaching down to get something, the weight, um, 
the effect that the weight has on your ligaments when you're stepping over a log, the amount that you sink into the mud. You are basically inhabiting, it feels like you're inhabiting another person's body. And Gina put on um, a great deal of weight, uh, even more than I did. I put on 19, um, and I think she put on 24. Either way, I, I, I laugh, like I was so funny when she said that, because that's, that's how I feel. Um, I do want to quickly go back to Beck's um, rod, the, the fire steel, how it was um, wearing out. That is a problem with fire steels, or ferro rod is the more correct term for what we're using. They've got a, a certain number of strikes that you can do them with. So if you can be really careful with, with your tinder and kindling, you can get away with a couple of strikes. But if it's really difficult, that's a problem with ferro rods. And that's why I took the, the very thickest uh, and longest one that I could have, just the greatest volume of ferro magnesium material so I could, you know, make, it, it wasn't just gonna wear away so quickly. So Jimmy uh, had COVID, uh, I can sympathize because I also had COVID. And I'm guessing I probably caught it at the same time as Jimmy. So boot camp was uh, about seven days long. Uh, we had strict COVID rules. We all wore masks. It was separate rooms. Everything was COVID. There was, you know, people handing out sanitizer everywhere, right? But it was in the thick of, uh, you know, what one of the worst times of COVID. And we flew down to Tasmania. Everyone funneled through an airport for a day or two to get there. And then we all sat together. You know, we're, we're trying to be separated, but, you know, there's a risk, right? And... Basically, someone must have got COVID. I reckon on the ingress, because it only takes about four to five days gestation. Um, I reckon someone got it on the ingress, uh, like to get to the location. Then they started showing symptoms and then Jimmy and I caught it. Um, so uh, I'll cover Jimmy's first. So he, he was coughing a bit. Uh, he felt like rubbish. He did a COVID test, it was positive. They came out and um, for Jimmy, unfortunately, he had the complications of his pulse rate, which is 120, 130, and also he's talking about pain in his left side. So, um, yes, yeah, just total bad luck. And I reckon <laughs> if Jimmy hadn't had those complications, he probably would have been like me and, and stayed out there, but he had complications, you know. And COVID's still not a known, a fully known beast, and we've got no food and it's cold. And there's, you know, if you do have a problem, um, you know, it's harder to get help. So. That's, that's the difference with me. So for me, um, you know, I was doing COVID tests every morning throughout boot camp and, um, you know, another one on the on day one launch day, um, all negative. But then during that day, uh, I was just like, oh man, I just feel really tired. And I was thinking to myself like, oh, is this just because, you know, it's, it's stress because I'm getting dropped out there. And honestly, the answer is no, because I've done a lot of these day one things like big deal day one kind of stuff and I was just like man I just feel really really tired I don't understand it but I just feel like lying down um, but I kind of fought through it and I was thinking man if I have got COVID like that's just really going to suck because I'm going to get pulled out uh, anyway so that very first night I actually went and put up my pole shelter on the very first night I was actually late to get dropped in I only had less than three hours of daylight so I just worked into the night to cut down those um, three tripod pole like a tripod another tripod, pole across the top, A-frame, because it's just, it's one of the most practical methods of putting a tarp up, really, keep it nice and taut. I wanted a lot of surface area so I could catch rain and had it in the boot there. Um, so that was all kind of part of my plan. Um, had a rubbish night, I woke up in the morning, felt really rubbish, and if you just listen to my voice, it's funny, my kids didn't notice that I had it. <laughs> Whereas my wife's watching the show, she's like, oh man, you look terrible. So, uh, just talking like that, um, you know, I've got droopy eyes, I've got no energy, whereas normally in that situation I'd be bouncing around. So that changed my entire game plan because I would recommend to anybody in that situation, the first thing you should do other than, you know, having a basic shelter up and having your gear dry is to do extensive reccees of your area. So my plan was on day two and three, whatever is required was to walk my entire boundary uh, which is probably, if, oh, it might have been like six, seven kilometres. It's hard, hard for me to know the exact distance because I was just kind of pointed out visually, hey, that ridge line, that, that ridge line, go there, that kind of stuff. But I was going to walk the whole thing. And the really important thing about that is you're finding out what resources are in your area. Building materials, 
what animals are around, where there's flat ground, potential fishing spots. And for all you know, there might be the Garden of Eden spot just around the corner where there's a natural rock overhang and you don't even have to build a shelter. So if you're in that kind of situation where you're gonna be doing long-term survival in one spot, that initial recce is so important to do right up front. And if you don't do that and you just go, oh, I'll, I'll do it later, I'll get set up, I'll make my nice shelter and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, three weeks later, you start to branch out and do this and you walk around the quarter and you find the Garden of Eden with the rock shelter and all of the paddy melons walking around in the paddock and the fish jumping out of the water. You'll be like, well, now I've wasted all this time. I'm going to have to move my whole camp, right? So it's, it's very, very important from a survival situation to do a really thorough recce. But knowing that I had COVID, I felt like absolute crap. Um, but if I had expanded all that energy of hiking, you know, I, I, plus I'm overweight, right? I'm 19 kilos overweight, so I'm puffing and panting and all that kind of stuff. To have starvation, COVID and physical exertion really hard for two or three days, I thought that there would be a risk that I would get complications, COVID complications. And that could take me out of the game. So I was already petrified of being taken out of the game. So part of my strategy to not get taken out was to um, make it look like I was going okay. So on that first, um, so yeah, the first morning, which is day two, I felt like crap, did a COVID test. The two little bars showed up. Um, <laughs> I gotta be honest, I did consider like, man, I'm out here by myself. Should I just shut up and not say anything? But we do have medical checks that are coming out. And if, if I was to not tell them, and they don't have the, you know, the full COVID procedures and they think that I'm isolated and I transfer it to them and then they transfer it to everybody else in the crew, I could have shut the whole uh, production down. So it would have been very selfish if I'd done that. So I told them um, and I was just petrified. I thought, the, I thought there was a 50% chance they'd say, no, nah, you're out, sorry, we're coming to get you. Uh, they didn't, I was very thankful for that, but I certainly didn't want to make it look like I was struggling. And I knew that you know, they're seeing the footage as it comes in. So, um, yeah, I, I fought through, um, you know, t you know, to make it look like I was capable, and I was reasonably capable. I just, um, I just felt really tired and like lying down. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it changed my strategy. I couldn't do the recce, so that's why I thought, okay, I'm going to make a kayak. I mean, I always plan to make a kayak um, anyway because they're such a useful thing. But I thought, okay, well, if I make the kayak now, it'll take me you know, a certain amount of time to make the kayak. By the time I've made the kayak, uh, COVID will be over and I can use the, the kayak for the recce. But the main thing about doing the kayak so early was making a kayak is much less of a workload than humping up hills with, you know, heavy pack. And we have to carry camera gear and safety gear, like, you know, like first aid kit and all that kind of stuff on our back when we go for a hike. So the, the lower workload of doing woodwork and cutting down saplings and, you know, that kind of stuff to make a kayak, I thought that's the best use of my time. Um, then when I do the recce, whilst I've, I have, you know, I've really, I've, I've been forced down a certain survival pathway here, at least when I do the recce, I can do all of the, the, um, the water-based stuff from the water and I'll use a lot less calories doing that. I'll still have to hike up the hills and stuff. So that's why I wanted to make a kayak um, so soon, basically. So that's EP2 and I can't wait to see EP3. Like it's just so surprising for me to see the things that happened because none of us know what happened. So it's amazing to be able to see it for real. Um, and I've, once again, I thought production did a great job putting that story together. So uh, yeah, stand by for uh, episode three recap in a week's time.